have that relationship with our, our daughters. And this is the whole point of why, you know, I created Heal in the Gap and why I wrote the book Celebrate Her Now because there is a disconnect. There is a disconnect between mother and daughter. And mother, again, meaning not only the, the, the biological mother but the community of mothers uh, that don't really know how to relate to young women and have, like I said, a lot of judgment um, because they don't understand how they are navigating their teen world and their teen life, et cetera. So I just... I think we. I think for for my approach, it's really about going back to the basics. How do I? How do they hear me? How do they see me? How do I hear them? How do I see them without? Oh my God, this little girl is too out of control. I feel like breaking her neck. You know what I mean? Kind yeah, of I mean, I think. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think um, you know one of the challenges is that we've seen throughout the ages. I mean, since the beginning of time, has been the gender. Excuse me, not the gender gap, the generation gap. Uh, between, you know, parents and particularly teens, because it's like your teen Absolutely. goes upstairs um, as a sweet, innocent child at, at 12 or 13 and comes back down as a monster, and you don't see him again until, like, 25. So, um, you know, I think a lot of parents feel that, but I definitely agree with the sentiment that there's got to be that connection, and I think, you know, mm-hmm. again, this goes back to priorities, because I think a lot of parents Absolutely. are, Absolutely. you know, very Absolutely. stressed, and they're feeling like, you know, in my perfect world, of course I'd be able to spend more time with my daughter. Of course I'd be able to um, ask her how her day was and mean it. But I think, mm-hmm. you know, it has to, we have to revisit what our values truly are. Absolutely. Do we, I agree 100%. Do we really value our girls? Do we really value empowering them to be the best women that they can be? Or do we value um, having more money, being able to take that extra trip to Six Flags? Because here's the thing, mm-hmm. i found mm-hmm. that girls really value the intangible. They'll tell you they want iPhones. They'll tell you they want this handbag and those shoes. But mm-hmm. they value someone caring about them. Someone looking well, we all in do. the eye and saying, "We all do. Them. We all yeah, do." Yeah. So Absolutely. I mean, I think it's it's very important that um, that we revisit what our values really are and be very clear about that because um, it may mean some sacrifice. It may mean some discomfort for a period of time, but we have to look at what the long-term implications are of some of our choices because I can't even tell you how many people, I can think of people off the top of my head who can say, oh, you know, my mom gave me this thing. She worked three jobs so that we could have Jordans and all this kind of stuff. And they have all kinds of issues. They got issues from here to Texas because mom was working all those jobs to get you those shoes, but mom didn't hug you. But mom sure. didn't help you with algebra. But mom wasn't there when you Absolutely. got out of school, so you never saw mom. But mom had, you know, every time Dick and Harry running up in the house with her boyfriend. So we have to really shift our perspective about uh, what's possible. And I think part of this is that a lot of these moms, particularly single moms, are going, well, since the dad is not around, I want him or her to have everything that I didn't have or everything that they should have. And that's fine. There's certainly nothing wrong with wanting your, your children to have the finer things in life, but I think we definitely have to get our priorities straight about what it's going to take to raise a generation of more conscious young adults and, and young adults whose uh, personalities and function of their being is rooted in things that are valuable, things that are meaningful, things that are going to be investments in humanity because the teens that we're raising now are the next generation of parents. And if we do I not agree. make... Uh, more significant investments in them, then I think we're going to to regret some of that over the next 30 to 40 years. So I want to talk more about about that and the media piece when we come back. We're going to take a quick break, and when we return, we'll continue our conversation with Lacey Clark on how you can empower the girls specifically and, and, and more broadly the teens in your community. So stay tuned. Do you wish you could learn the secrets of achieving and become successful? Author and inspiration expert Lisa Nicole Bell has designed a goal-setting and goal-getting MP3 just for you. In this information-packed download, you'll learn how your thinking affects your goal-setting abilities, how to set goals that will serve you, how to overcome fear, how to create a plan that works to achieve your goals, how to go from success to success with ease. This download would inspire you to get going with your goals right away. No more waiting and wondering. You'll finish the download inspired and ready to make things happen in your life. Visit www.thedivinestore.com. Welcome back to the Inspired Life. Here's your host, Lisa Nicole Bell. Welcome back. We are live on air with Lacey Clark discussing empowering girls. Just talking about, uh, you know, how everything that's happening in hip hop culture and the media is affecting our teen girls. The call in number is 347 347- 
347-215-7759. Again, that's 347-215-7759. So, Lacey, I want to talk about the media because we kind of talked about um, before the break we were talking. What's that? No, I was going to ask you a quick question. before. I wanted to comment on what you said before we had the break. Oh, okay? sure. Go for it. Oh, yeah, I love the I hear the question. I just want to comment. I was going to say I agree. I, I want to say I agree a lot with you said about uh, <clears throat> just being really clear about values. I think that's a huge piece that, um, again, is a fundamental piece as we talk about what it takes to actually be solution oriented. Again, a lot of times, specifically in the African American community or communities of color, it is about uh, from the parents' perspective. You know, how can I, um, unfortunately, keep up with the Joneses? How can I actually show that I have success? And if it takes me to work two jobs to do so, then I will do that. And so what ends up being neglected is the structure of the family life, the quality time. And so um, I agree that part of the solution, I think, to this process um, of actually, you know, embracing our girls and helping uh, net, help, helping them and supporting them and navigating to a healthier life is to, again, prioritize the intangible, like you said earlier before the break. And I think that our culture, unfortunately, is in a space where we do, you know, celebrate the things that are tangible before the things that are intangible because those are the things that we can actually kind of wear on our sleeve. And, um, and I think that, again, what suffering is the family, the family structure, the family breakdown, the family uh, uh, opportunities for connection and value. Um, and so if we were talking about the first step, I think the first step would definitely be, you know, well, what is your value? What is important to you? And how can we reshape? And that's, I think, what, you know, part of the life coaching that I do is about is how to reshape you know, your lifestyle according to what you value. Because you may say, well, I want to spend more time with my child, but meanwhile you have two jobs. Or meanwhile, you know, you're working all the time when you have one job and you're, it's 80 hours a week. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. And then lastly I wanted to say that um, one of the reasons why I created Self-Love Day, which today is a Self-Love Day, so happy Self-Love Day. <laughs> um, I created Self-Love Day uh, every the 13th of every month is to, to act as a reminder. So the calendar is marked early in the year, January 13th, uh, February 13th, March 13th, all the way down the calendar for uh, a recognition of a holiday, a holiday that, that I created called Self-Love Day. And the intention of the holiday was to really remind women specifically, because, uh, again, it starts with the community, I think, um, <clears throat> remind women specifically uh, to practice self-love, not to say I love myself and raise my hand and say, how many of you love yourself and you raise your hand, but to practice self-love and that you have a day on the calendar from January of the year all the way to December of, the, uh, of that year that you are going to focus attention on yourself. Now, the intention is to allow this day to expand, and it becomes a weekly practice and a daily practice. But I think because, again, our culture is very focused on I got to get, I got to get, I got to get, has to acquire all these things that the focus specifically for women is not on us. The focus is on how can I please this man? How can I, you know, uh, 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 you know, keep my household? Can I, how can I career change? Depending on who we're talking about, who, no matter who you are as a woman. The bottom line is that because we have this uh, this ability to nurture, it's important that we give that same love back to that to ourselves. And how that relates to our girls is that now we become a model. So this teen girl looks at this adult woman, and she says, well, I saw my mom cut her phone off, you know, one day throughout the month. I saw my mom just literally take the moment to sleep when she felt tired. I saw my mom, or the mother in my life, uh, you know, uh, really go, you know, take time to be consistent about going to spas. Or whatever that, that self-love act is, there's a model and that we can begin to introduce those models to our girls that help them start to create a foundation of I have to love and value myself first before I can love and value anyone else. And so I think if we're talking about solutions in terms of a larger problem, which is about values, how do we remind our women specifically and then our young women that they are important in their lives and that they deserve a say and a way to um, uh, effectively act out a positive, healthy lifestyle um, that they would like to create. So self-love day, I want to say, is an opportunity for women to practice, and not just say it, but practice self-love and, then wa- and, and have the women, the girls in their lives watch that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I think those are fantastic points because um, 
teens, I mean, we know this of children, but it's true of teens as well, they do as you do, not as you say. And Absolutely. And when Absolutely. you're sending mixed messages to them by telling them to do one thing and yet you're doing uh, the opposite or something that's out of alignment with that, then they begin to question the validity of what it is that you're telling them. In fact, Absolutely. I believe they question your integrity as a whole because they Absolutely. see you out of alignment. But then mm-hmm. beyond that, they're questioning whether they should really be believing what you say. And the unfortunate thing is that if, if you say, you know, um, it's re- you need to rest. You've been going all week. You've had practice. You've been at school. Mm-hmm. You need to mm-hmm. seem to rest. And yet mm-hmm. you work 60 hours a week. Then they're going, well, maybe not. How come mm-hmm. it's good enough for me but not good enough for you? Mm-hmm. And then when you turn around and say, you can be anything you want to be, and yet you're stuck at this job that you hate, that you're always complaining mm-hmm. about when you get off. Mm-hmm. Now they're going, well, I see you working 60, 70 hours a week for someone you don't like, doing mm-hmm. something you don't like to do, doing something that drains you and makes you take it out on me when you get home. Maybe it isn't really possible for me mm-hmm. to do everything. Maybe um, those are fairy tales for people like Beyonce, you know, maybe that's not something that I can actually attain. Maybe I can't have my own business. Maybe I can't um, participate in politics or, or whatever it is she might want to do. I definitely think there has to be that alignment of word and deed for us if Absolutely. we are going to empower our girls um, in, in a meaningful way. So I, I definitely agree with those points. Um, one of the things that you have said is that MTV and BET are parenting our children. I mm-hmm. agree. Uh, with that sentiment, tell me why you believe that. Again, because I think the value system is is material. So you have parents who are out of the home who are consistently, you know, working or doing something that's not really focused on family. And so you have, you know, girls who are watching. I think, I think now it's evolving. I think BT and MTV is still raising our young people, but because we have the Internet access, so uh, on the phones and so forth, you know, they can access videos in the same culture that's on BET and MTV and even, you know, grander ways. Um and so I think because, again, the parents aren't home or the community isn't available. And, I, again, I keep saying the word community because I feel like it's not always about the mother and the father, per se. But, you know, the village, you know, um, we're about the village to raise a child concept is, you know, is the aunt, is the, is the uncle, is the, you know, the cousin, is the, is the, you know, the neighbor, is the council. I mean, there's so many people that are involved in the rearing of a child from my perspective. And so I think that um, you're finding because people are stretched so much that that community is, is absent. Um, and so because that community is absent, girls look for other opportunities to find out ways to, you know, handle, um, you know, a vaginal itch. They're not going to mom. They're not going to aunt. They're not going to you know, uh, the cousin, they're going on the Internet and finding, well, how do I deal with a vaginal itch? So they'll type that in into Google, and they get the answers right there. So, it's, you know, so I'm just keeping it real. I mean, because you, you wouldn't, you know, you feel a little embarrassed. Well, how would you do that? You know, how would I find out about that? And I think because, again, now all of um, – of their support is is intangible. It's it's like you know through the internet, through TV, through radio, through movies, um, and so again, I think that the community needs to show up. You know, and and what I mean by showing up, I mean consistently and making themselves available uh, to this young woman for difficult conversations like that and sexual conversations and you know just or career conversations or inspiration conversations or whatever that that case may be. Um, and that's why I think that BET and MTV and, and a lot of other media outlets are raising our girls and our boys because, again, um, people have put their priorities elsewhere, and our young people aren't priority number one. Mm-hmm. I definitely, uh, I mean, I agree with everything that you just said, and um, and it's been my observation of, of, you know, what you're saying about the intangible. It's that, you know, mom and dad don't have as much time um, and I also think sometimes, you know, the issue isn't time. It's that mm. mom and dad don't know what to say. That mom and dad are intimidated by the act of even initiating that conversation. Because I've, I've seen situations where some parents, it's not that they're strung out and stressed out and running around like crazy. They're upstairs in the bedroom watching TV, and the girl is downstairs on the computer. <laughs> right, right, right. <clears throat> this is not an issue of time. It's not an issue of you not having what you need. It's just a matter of you having the guts to say, mm-hmm. Hey, come here. Let's talk. 
because for for a lot of us, because of the advent of technology and the internet and um, how digital our lives have become, many of us are intimidated by the intimacy created by sitting down and looking another person in the eye and having a, a conversation. We almost feel Excellent. transparent. <laughs> Absolutely. As I was going to say, the exact, that same thing. I mean, that's exactly it. I think one of the reasons why, and I, and I can speak directly to my life, you know, growing up, you know, with one of my, my mentors or my, my inspirations being my aunt. She lived in my household, and she was a couple of years older than I was. But what's interesting about what you just said about the transparency is that, you know, a lot of things have, have happened to her over the course of her teen years that she never told me anything about. And I didn't find anything about it, out about it until I was an adult. I'm like, well, why don't you tell me this? Why didn't you tell me that, you know, that she was raped? And, I mean, there's a lot of things that happened in her life. And a lot of it is because she didn't have um, the opportunity to heal. She didn't find the opportunity to heal. She didn't have the support to heal. She didn't all the above. So now it's the secret and it's the shame. And now I feel like I'm being left open as her niece without the information that I need to know about how to navigate my teen world and be a lot safer and aware and conscious of what's going on. And so I think that that becomes a pattern, too, that, you know, having these children, you know, really serves as a mirror to the things that maybe we didn't get, you know what I mean, growing up. Um, and what that means, you know, for me to say, okay, I'm hearing you tell me about the type of sexual experiences you're having. And I have to look at, ooh, okay, how do I handle this? From a, from a, a, I don't want to say authority, but from a, um, a, um, a, an adult perspective, but at the same time really be kind of honest about what I've experienced. And that's the hardest thing is honesty. You know what I mean? To be real. Like, okay, I'm going to be real about where I've come from and what I've, what I've experienced. So I feel you. I, I feel you 100%. Yeah. And, and, but I also wanted to cl- clarify too, I think that the specific issue about the time it, whether it's time, whether it's whatever it is, I think that the overall through line is that there's unavailability. Whether mm-hmm. they're upstairs playing the Sega, I mean, I have, you know, some of the fathers that I've seen, you know, the way they actually kind of check out is through video games. Yep. You know what I mean? And so it's kind of like, well, where's the dad? I need you, dad, to show up and talk to her about some of the things that men are thinking. But he's not there because he's shut down and he's not, for whatever reason. So, you're right. I agree. So I think that to kind of clarify it, I would say that I would use the word I said, uh, it's unavailable. You know, these parents unfortunately are unavailable, whether it's a time piece or an emotionally unavailable piece or whatever it is, there's an unavailability in our culture that I think is, is unacceptable. Yeah. With, with all of the messages that girls are receiving, um, you know, from TV, magazines, hip-hop culture, how can, you know, if there's a parent listening who's like, okay, this really resonates with me, um, I want to be more present with my children, or I, I'm realizing now that there are some some things that I haven't done. There's some disservices I've done to my son or my daughter. Um, how can can they begin to combat those those negative messages? How can they um, set their children up for success by providing that emotional support? And even if they don't have all the time in the world to do that, what are some specific, simple things they can do to begin to empower their teens in the face of the hip-hop generation? Great question. Love that question. A couple things. Uh, one, I would say that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that, you know, it's really important. I, the one again, the reason why I created Self Love Day is to re- remind women to practice, practice what they want to preach. Practice it, practice it, practice it. And so one reason why I work so, the, the book Celebrate Her Now is because I see that a lot of mentors and women want to be active in the roles, um, in the lives of young women, but don't really know where to start or how to take a, you know, what step to take next. And I always say that the first step is to actually look at yourself and really, you know, are you, are you a model? Are you someone that someone can look at and really kind of be proud of? Is your lifestyle, um, a, you know, something that you're proud of and can someone else be proud of it? And if the answer is no in certain areas, then what ways can you actually start to, you know, embrace that within your own life? Um, And so I think the first step is self. So I am going to take a healthy, active role in my care of self so that, therefore, again, I can actually show it and not just speak it. So that's the first step, I think. Um, Secondly, I think that, again, um, in that is really kind of being – available and celebratory and committed to your values. 
Um, and I think that, you know, again, is a whole approach within itself. But what is, what is it that you value? What do you think is important to your life? And once you kind of get clarity around that, then you can actually start to create your life, 